Good morning, everyone. This is Jeffy Kennedy, author of Epic Fantasy Romance. I'm here with my first cup of coffee. Well, it's actually a lie. I'm here with my Trenta Passion Tea. Uh, today is, say it with me, people, Friday, woohoo, uh, August 14th, no, what is it, August 16th, ah, time she flies. Um, many thanks to Woodstock Chimes for providing me a little bit of opening chimes. I don't think it came through very well, um, but... <laughs> They have a, um, a cool website where you can actually listen to the different chimes. Uh, since I don't have my chimes with me, uh, it's also why I'm like not actually on my first cup of coffee. It's almost 11 o'clock here in Tucson. And I know that many of you will be like, uh, Jeffy, you didn't say you were going to Tucson. Jeffy didn't know she was going to Tucson. Uh, on um, what day is it? Wednesday. On Wednesday, uh, my mom messaged me saying that she was really sick in the morning. And I um, I wasn't sure what to do. It's hard to make that decision. Uh, you know, like, is she going to be fine? And my husband, David, said, go with your gut. And my gut said I needed to be here. And so I flew to Tucson that evening. Uh, it worked out well because I finished writing Reluctant Wizard on Wednesday morning <laughs> and sent that off to my uh, beta slash proofreader friend and flew here, got here late Wednesday night and yesterday did rounds of doctors with my mom and it turns out that she has almost certainly got a bleeding ulcer um, which had gotten to the point of making her violently ill. So she is somewhat reassured um, that <laughs> she was like, at least I wasn't making up, that I felt really bad. And I'm glad that I made the decision to come. So uh, if you're on video, this is my mom's guest room. And it's, um, it's very comfortable. And she asked me if I was going to do a podcast today. And I said I wasn't certain. But then I decided, yes, yes, I am. So you all get a podcast today. Uh, I'm still not sure how long I'm staying. She has more tests today. And so we will um, get through those and kind of see what the results are. But she's already on medication and already feeling better. So, yeah, things are, are going all right. Uh, very glad that I had the bandwidth and ability to come here at the last moment like this. Um, yeah, so finish Reluctant Wizard. That's awesome. And then... Um, Astute listeners with good memories may recall that I needed to turn in copy and line edits for Never the Roses by today, and I did. Yay! So I, I have long been in the habit of when I visit here of going and sitting at the Starbucks because I wake up early uh, in the summertime. Arizona's an hour behind us anyway, so um, I continue to wake up early, go to sleep early. <laughs> Uh, but my mom's still sleeping, so I go and I sit at the Starbucks and I have my latte and I even have my preferred table <laughs> there and I work on whatever it is that I'm needing to work on. So yesterday I was able to go through all of the line and copy edits. They were very light and finish those out this morning, you know, like a few of the requeries and also the dedication and acknowledgments. And so now it is wrapped. Woohoo! And... Um, my editor, Diana, who is the assistant editor, but has taken over for the time being while editor Ali is on parental leave, um, she messaged me and she said, this is breaking news. Only a few of my friends have heard this already. Um, so she just told me, and so I just found out, she said, I recently learned that Never the Roses was approved for end papers case stamp and sprayed edges Woo! and she even put multiple exclamation points in parentheses and she said all of that along with the map there's going to be like two pages of map is going to make a dreamy package to hold isn't she great dreamy it's going to be dreamy folks uh, if you like me uh, do not want to 
case stamp is. I had to Google that term. Uh, the case stamp is when you have like a hardbound book, which this will be. I think I told you all that already. Let me see if I can find you an example from my mom's copious bookshelves. See all of her bookshelves? I come by it, honestly. All right, hold on a moment here. Okay, so um, here is a hardback book. This is The Splendid and the Vile by Eric Larson, which is the saga of Churchill family and defiance during the Blitz, which actually looks pretty interesting. But this is nice, pretty hardback and it's got the jacket on it, right? And I've seen people debating about like whether or not they keep the jackets on their books. I didn't know that there were people who took the jackets off the books. I'm a jacket keeper honor, uh, but apparently some people take the jackets off, which it's easily removable. Think of any hardback where you take that jacket off and then inside is your sort of fabric covered hardback book and on the spine it says Eric Larson and the Splendid in the Vile in kind of a lovely copper foil uh, stamp and so that's the the stamp and that's super cool um, and actually this book's a good example because it has end papers so it has these cool papers with like a nice image there a photo from the Blitz, appropriately enough. And I don't know if there's anything at the end. I don't know why they call them front end end papers, but so anyway, really so great. Uh, and I don't think she has any with sprayed edges, but the sprayed edges are when they have a design on the edges so that if you put all the pages together, you get to see something. It's all very exciting. So yeah, my life is interesting at this point, right? Um, you know, such exciting things professionally, uh, hard things with my mom. We are going to start building her a casita on our property in Santa Fe so that she can come start visiting for a little while. Uh, you know, and go back and forth. So I'm, I'm excited to do that. That'll help a whole lot. Um, other things. So, so yeah, I did all this work this morning, got that stuff done. Um, drinking my Trenta passion tea now, cause it's very hot in Tucson. Um, nicely, uh, um, air conditioned inside and so forth. I actually get cold sitting at the Starbucks. So it's funny being here at Tucson this time of year because you like take a jacket to wear inside. Um, yeah, so let's see a few other things I wanted to talk about because I did make some notes. Uh, oh, so one thing um, I saw an author that I admire, big influence on me, uh, talking on social media. And I think it's good to share the realities of publishing, which is what they were doing. Uh, but there was also, I think we have to be careful about complaining people. And so I have a, a as I often do, I have a couple of thoughts combining together and we'll see how coherent this comes out. But I also saw this morning uh, John Scalzi talking about idolizing authors and specifically he was talking about Neil Gaiman and the allegations against Neil Gaiman. And I am um, I'm in a very difficult place about that because these are allegations of um, sexual assault, sexual abuse, and I'm very much a believe women kind of person. Um, I am I'm skeptical on the source in this case because, and, and I really don't want to uh, be an apologist. I don't, I've never met Neil. Um, I am an admirer of Neil, as many of you who have watched listen to this podcast will know, 
But these allegations from a number of women, and, and there have been, I think, like four to date, have been publicized by a podcast that is done by Boris Nelson's sister. Boris Nelson being the odious, very right-wing prime minister in Britain. And I've, I feel like, this is entirely my opinion, but that this is part of an attempt to smear high-profile pop culture icons uh, who are heroes to liberals. Because Neil Gaiman is very open about uh, his uh, liberal leanings. So it's a multi-part podcast. I have not listened to it. I've read some things that were like, I listen, so you don't have to. Uh, and so I won't comment on the content of it. But I do think that it's important to remember that there are, have been no legal measures taken to date that I'm aware of. Uh, there are no civil suits. There are no, um, you know, any kind of uh, anything brought by any of the countries or the states where these things occurred. It's all, um, all of the allegations have come from, have been channeled through, let's put it this way, channeled through that podcast. And it's, it's part of the thing of this day and age that we use social media to name and shame. And sometimes that's a good thing. It's, it's a powerful tool. It is also a powerful weapon. And uh, a lot of people have, have pretty much convicted Neil Gaiman um, on this basis. And I mean, I guess that's up to everyone to decide. Uh, it's, it's a really difficult situation. John Scalzi responded to it because someone had said now that they were so disappointed in Neil Gaiman that who would they idolize now and potentially John Scalzi. And I should um, link to Scalzi's essay on this because it's very good. Okay, I found it and I will link to it. Um, but Scalzi is basically saying don't, I don't idolize him. And he gives good reasons why. And I think that, as usual, he's put together a very thoughtful um as a series of ideas, basically explaining why you shouldn't idolize any creator because, um, you know, there's a tendency to conflate the love of the creation with the creator, uh, which isn't fair because we all, as Scalzi points out, present these very curated uh, versions of ourselves where you don't know all of our flaws. You don't know our... Um, very, you know, the unpleasant aspects to ourselves, the ways in which we are less than admirable human beings, which is true of every single one of us, because nobody is perfect, right? Uh, and so he makes good points. I keep saying that. Um, I fundamentally disagree with him on one aspect where he says that there is no more reason to admire an author for writing a book that you love than there is to idolize your plumber for fixing something. And he, he even scrambles a little bit for an example, talking about uh, his plumber rescuing their uh, home from inches of water and how much he wanted to worship that guy for fixing things, and which is funny. And we've all been there. But I kind of disagree in that I understand why it's tempting to idolize a creator because we love their work, because this does essentially come from their core selves. Uh, one of the best description I ever heard of voice is that voice in our authorial works is a reflection of our beliefs, of our values, and that this is going to come through, that you are going to end up reading for uh, the experience of being inside that author's worldview. And I think there's something legitimate to that. Um, that's why there's such a powerful disconnect, um, sometimes an incredible dissonance, when you read the author 
when you, I'm sorry, when you meet the author of a work you loved and you discover that you do not like them as a person, which has happened to all of us, I believe. Uh, probably the only people this has not happened to is anyone who has not yet gotten to meet their favorite author. And who knows, were I to actually meet Neil Gaiman, uh, perhaps I would be disappointed in him as a human being. It's hard to say, right? And I would say that it's gone all directions. I mean, uh, I admired Grace Draven as an author, uh, loved her books, totally grokked her voice and her uh, stories still do. And she's turned out to be one of my best friends and one of my favorite people in the entire world. I also have author friends who are some of my favorite people in the entire world, and I don't like their work. And that happens to all of us. Uh, I also have met authors who um, I love their work and I met them and couldn't stand them. Um, they turned out to be terrible people. And maybe sometimes it's just that they're actually very socially awkward people. I've met authors that I admired and talked to them and they were very abrupt with me, like at their signing table. And um, I came away feeling, I, I, I want to say unloved, unappreciated. And maybe that was me coming to the table with um, too much idolatry, too much admiration, too much expectation. Uh, you know, when you feel like you are best friends with the characters on a book, or um, your book boyfriend, and you know that it came from this person's mind, there is a tendency to conflate, to think that then the person who conceived of that or channeled that maybe more precisely will also have that kind of meaningfulness to you. And obviously, for an author, there's a lot more of the readers than there is of them, right? So there might be thousands of us, hundreds of thousands in some cases, who adore, adore those characters and believe they would adore the author, and there is no way that the author could reciprocate. Um, so I think it's understandable. I think it's more nuanced than John Scalzi paints it. Uh, it's not like admiring a plumber. But I do agree with his essential point that you shouldn't be idolizing authors. Uh, you know, flawed human beings, all of us, maybe don't idolize anyone. You know, like, I get that question sometimes, you know, like, who are your idols? And it's like, well, I don't know, no one. <laughs> you know, you, you take the good and the bad, you admire what people produce, um, and it try to extract from that. And so coming around to like how I sort of inched my way into this by this author talking about the ways that they are disappointed in publishing. I, and this is, I'm speaking to the authors who are listening to this, I suppose, although it's also useful for readers, you know, it's, um, everybody likes to bitch about their job, right? Everybody has things about their job that they don't like, uh, I had told a friend of mine about how I had to come here and they had said, you know, I'm so glad you were able to get away. And, you know, that's a great thing about my job is that I could leave um, at a moment's notice like that. And I could bring my work with me that I can do my job from anywhere. And I am incredibly, inf incredibly fortunate about that. And it's important to me to remember all the ways in which the job I have is amazing. And sure, sometimes publishing does things that are disappointing, but I think we have to be careful about complaining about those things too much. And readers, I would just take those things with a grain of salt. Uh, I think authors think sometimes if they complain about how their publishers treated them, that this might create weight from their audience, uh, pressure to, to fix this thing that they're unhappy about. And I don't think it really does. So I don't know. I, I'm not sure I completely melded all of those ideas together, but um, maybe I came close. 
So, uh, I don't know if I'm going to be here or there by Monday. Always a motion is the future. But um, I think either way, I will talk to you all on Monday. You all take care. Bye-bye.